So I'd like to get uh, started with our next presentation and particularly because the introductions that I've been making have made us run over late. Uh, I'm going to abbreviate this one. Uh, I'll simply say that we have a leading natural language processing researcher, Professor Chris Manning from Stanford University. Okay. Um, good morning. I'm Chris Manning from Stanford University, and this I'm going to tell you a little today about um, how deep learning has been using to transform natural language processing. Um, before getting into the details, I thought I'd just say a little bit about what's so special about human language. So, Language is the most distinctive human characteristic. Lots of animals have extremely good vision systems, haptic systems, olfactory systems, but humans alone have language. And if there's hope for getting more of a window into our brains and providing explainable intelligence, it seems like that's gonna to have to take place through language. Um, language has also been key to human societal intelligence. So maybe a chimpanzee or a bonobo is not so different in intelligence to a human being, but because we have language, we've been able to network our brains together and come up with a form of societal intelligence. Language is special compared to a lot of other signals since it's actually human constructed to convey meaning. So for a lot of other things, whether it's astronomy data or shopping baskets, we just have this data which statisticians try to form meaning from aggregates of what passes by. But for language, individual human beings are trying to convey information through their messages. And we've managed to come up with this encoding that very little kids can learn, so that even while their cognitive abilities aren't that advanced, they can amazingly quickly acquire this difficult natural language. And finally, language is part of a very complex social system. Our own motivations to acquire and comprehend language are interacting in this complex social system. Language is also interesting in another way, because language is a discrete symbolic or categorical signaling system. We have words like rocket and violin, which refer, refer to classes of entities in the world. Um, sometimes in the modern deep learning world, people think that symbols were just this mistaken invention of logic um, or classical AI, but they're very inherent to our human languages. Um, on the other hand, we use continuous communication signals um, to communicate language to other human beings. And what's interesting there is that there are various continuous substrates we can use, speech, gestures, writing, but we have symbols of language that are invariant across those encodings. Um, this has raised the interesting cognitive science question. Are there nearly symbolic representations used in the brain? The traditional ideas of a language of thought suggested yes. Whereas other people would like to believe that perhaps our thinking more closely follows the continuous substrate of our neural systems. Okay, um, the, there's no doubt at all that the breakthrough moment for modern deep learning um, was success in object recognition in the ImageNet challenge. But actually the first successes of deep learning in the modern era were a couple of years earlier for speech recognition. Um, so George Dahl, first working with um, Jeff Hinton, then later at Microsoft, showed that it was possible to train um, deep neural networks, first as acoustic feature recognizers, and then later this work was extended to the entire of speech recognition systems, and they produced huge dramatic gains. So in the initial work of Dahl and colleagues, already we saw about a 33% drop in the word error rate of speech recognition systems. Give that another five years and the error rates have dropped by about three quarters from what they were in 2012. And so it's largely due to, due to deep learning that we now have great speech recognition systems that you can find on the cell phones in every one of your pockets. More recently, deep learning has also been extended to the other end of the speech um, 
um, direction, um, so where it has also been used to give better speech synthesis. Um, so traditionally, when people did speech synthesis, you patched together teeny little bits of human language recordings. So it was like an audio ransom note, and that worked out pretty well. Now at this point, I asked the audio guy, I've got no idea how to play the audio in my presentation. I wonder if he knows. <laughs> Maybe I won't play the audio, so you won't hear that. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so people had tried to make parametric models of speech recognition, but they just didn't perform as well. Um, but more recently, again, using um, deep generative models, which are frame by frame producing the audio, that the WaveNet model from DeepMind really produces extremely natural um, sounding speech, better than either of the preceding types of models. Okay, but for language, we don't only have speech recognition and speech synthesis. Most of what goes on in language that we want to understand is the, the words, the sentences, the ideas that go on in between the speech synthesis and the speech recognition. And so what we'd like to do in natural language understanding is unlock the meanings of language and use that as a tool so that we can better understand the world just as human beings do. Um, traditionally in natural language processing or linguistics, the dominant thinking has been from the work of Noam Chomsky. And so Chomsky has prominently believed that there's just no chance of human beings learning the structure of language from the signals alone and has sort of poo-pooed the idea that probabilities were useful for language whatsoever and has advocated a position where you have an innate language capacity with very strong inductive biases for the acquisition and use of human language. That stands in contradistinction to other research distinctions, um, such as Claude Shannon's um, from his pioneering work in information theory, which argues for sort of using probability in information theory as a key concept for understanding signals, and in large measure as those ideas that are fed into modern um, natural language processing. Um, but to give an idea of traditional language um, processing, some of you might remember the computer game Zork, if you're around my age. Um, you were standing in an open field west of a White House, and you could give commands like open mailbox. And behind the scenes, this had um, natural language parsing into tree-like structures of this and semantic interpretation. This, if a simple example, is the kind of classic natural language processing of around the 1980s. Um, but we want to get uh, beyond that. And one of the first limitations you can notice in these models is that any of these rule-based or those kind of statistical natural language processing models of the 90s and 2000s still worked with words as symbols like hotel and laptop. And the problem with that is then we don't have any natural model of how words are similar to each other. So for example, in web search, if a user searches for Dell notebook, notebook battery size, we'd also like to match with Dell laptop battery capacity. Or if you search for Seattle motel, you'd like to match with Seattle hotel. And that's not something we get for free from symbols. There's no shared representation between these different symbols for words, even though they're similar in meaning. And so people have wanted to work to solve that. And a dominant idea has been this idea of distributional semantics, that you can learn about the meaning of a word by looking at the distribution of contexts, the words in the context in which they occur. So if I want to know the word, what the word laptops means, I can look for sentences that have the word laptops in them and look at the words in the context, often summed up as J.R. Firth's aphorism, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. This idea has been reinvented in the context of distributed representation models by saying, well, suppose we represent each word as a high dimensional vector. We can then have a high dimensional vector space and it will turn out that words will be able to represent it in such a way that words of similar meaning will be very close together in that space. Um, so that different verbs will group together and classes of verbs in in the space. And this kind of representation has been extremely useful as a low-level meaning representation. 
It turns out you can build these representations in an extremely simple way. I think one of the things that's actually amazing about the success of deep learning is it's turned out that a few extremely simple ideas, almost unbelievably simple ideas, have turned out to have enormous power. So for this idea, we say that each word is going to be represented as a high dimensional real valued vector. We are going to say that the probability of a word appearing in a context is going to be given proportional to the dot product of the vectors of the two words. And we say that our loss function is just going to be the extent to which we can't accurately give high probability to words that appear in the context of each other. And then we just have nothing else in the system apart from saying stochastic gradient descent, go off and fiddle around with the representations of these words. So you choose representations so that words that appear in the context of each other end up having similar word vectors so their dot product is high. It's sort of unbel unbelievable that that could work as a way of learning word meaning, but it turns out to work incredibly well. In particular, what's interesting is it doesn't only put similar word meanings close to each other. It, there actually come to be directions in this um, word vector space which have meaning. So here you can see progression from positives to comparatives to superlatives of adjectives. And in the word vector space, there are pretty constant um, vector additions that can be done to move you from each of these forms. Of course, and, oh sorry, yeah, um, these, word, these word vector representations or neural encodings as they're often termed prove to be just incredibly useful for just about all NLP tasks. And so one NLP task is finding person names and organization names in text. And so if you just took what used to be um, the best kind of um, NLP systems for finding things like person and location names, and you said add word vectors to your system, that already gave you a very nice lift and you got several points in accuracy. However, we don't only want to deal with word meanings. We want to get beyond that into understanding the structure and meaning of text. And it's turned out that a totally useful starting point for that has been the idea of a language model. So a language model simply predicts what is going to be the next word that is going to be said. We see these language models on the surface every day. So if you're doing predictive text on a phone or you're looking at search completions on Google, those are language models at work. But language models have many, many other uses. So we use them in speech recognition, machine translation, text generation. Um, their uses go on and on. And so this has led into the first big class of neural networks that have been highly successful for natural language processing, the idea of having a recurrent language model. And the idea here is that we start with having word embeddings, but in addition to that, we have a recurrent state so that a new state is calculated above each successive word by taking the next input word, multiplying it by a matrix, taking the previous hidden state, multiplying it by a matrix, summing those, putting it through a nonlinearity, and that gives the next hidden state, and we repeat, repeat recurrently through the sentence. Um, in addition to that, we can then predict what the next word is going to be, giving us that language model. And the way we do that is from the hidden state, we then put that through another matrix multiply and a softmax, and that gives us a probability distribution over next words. And again, what happens is we just say we're going to have a loss, which is the extent to which you give a low probability to the next word that actually occurred in a pile of text that we saw. And thereafter, we just say, go off and train this model by stochastic gradient descent to change all of the parameters in all of the matrices. And it works to produce a wonderfully good um, predictive language model of what words um, come next. And I'll come back to you later, how good are those models? 
Um, we can use this to then generate our own text um, by sampling text. So we have the hidden state and the starting off point, and then we predict the next word, copy it down, use it as the input, predict again, copy that down, and keep along. And this gives us a generative model by which we can generate new text. There's one other technical idea that proved to be super influential. So if you look at what this model is doing at the recurrent stage, it's keeping on multiplying by the same matrix WH, and that proves to be very problematic. So people came up with this idea of maybe what we should do is have a bypass where the previous state would just be passed straight forward past the next piece of neural network. And so effectively, we've got something like an updating memory so that you could just pass forward stuff that was already in the memory or you could run stuff through a neural network and update parts of the memory. That doesn't seem a very complex idea, but it was completely transformative um, for getting large recurrent neural networks to work and the so-called LSTMs, which became so famous that they got mentioned in an Apple iPhone keynote. And it's also been exactly the same idea that has allowed very deep networks to work visually. So any of the kind of um, ResNets and ResNex that um, Jitendra was mentioning before, where people are building very deep networks now in vision are using exactly the same idea of adding a bypass. Um, something that's even more surprising is once we had this idea of a language model, we could literally just butt two of them together and say, we can use this as a machine translation system. We will read in an input sentence and run it through our recurrent net and then we'll have a second recurrent net for a different language and say, based on that initial state, start generating words. And again, the powerful idea is that we have a defined loss function at the end, and we just run this on lots of pairs of sentences and their translations, and the neural network can simultaneously optimize all of the parameters to make this work. Of course, really, we make the network deeper and bigger, but it's, again, you know, quite amazing and phenomenal that simply doing this allowed one to use this sort of simple regular architecture and build a machine translation system which worked better than anything that existed before. Any of the kind of traditional NLP systems or statistical NLP systems with lots of hand-built modeling components for word order, syntactic structure, different forms of words, that simply optimizing in, in a big neural network is actually giving you more power. There's still one big limitation of having this structure that I've shown here, which is all the information the source sentence has to pass through one time step where it's then used to generate all of the output. So we kind of have a bottleneck between our two neural networks. That's unlike what a human translator would do, because a human translator would look back at the source sentence and translate bits of it as they go. And so that's led to a second important stage of development in what we now use everywhere, which is the idea of attention. So now when we're running our generator neural network, we say, let's use this hidden state to also look back at the source sentence. So again, we're going to use a fairly simple similarity calculation, a kind of generalized dot product, to say which um, source sentence hidden states are we similar to. We're going to work out, based on that similarity, uh, uh, distribution over our extent of similarity with different source states, and then we're going to create a weighted average of the source hidden states, and then we're also going to use that to inform the next word that we generate. And this idea of attention has proved to be a second hugely successful idea for powering modern neural, neural networks this decade. Um, once we had those two ideas, we could then produce uh, machine translation systems that were just much better than what used to exist. So here's showing one evaluation um, where the Edinburgh, Karlsruhe, and Heidelberg systems were kind of state-of-the-art statistical machine translation systems from around 2014-15. And using a neural machine translation system instantly gave us about a 25% reduction in the error rate, which is again a huge um, leap by the standards of these systems. 
Um, in fact, neural machine translation was so much better um, than what preceded it that this led to an extremely rapid commercial transition. So it was really only in 2014 that people first started um, playing with neural networks for doing machine translation. And only three years later, basically all of the large tech companies are using it and finding much better results. Um, something that's been really interesting about modern neural networks is to the extent that there are just these very few ideas that people can just use over and over again in different contexts, and they work successfully in lots of different places. Um, so I thought I'd say a little bit about um, doing textual question answering, which al already came up briefly in the first talk. And so the idea is we've got all the knowledge of the world in Wikipedia just about, and so we'd like like to be able to ask a question of Wikipedia, how many of Warsaw's inhabitants spoke Polish in 1933? And then we might go through two phases. We first of all might try and retrieve relevant documents, for which we might use regular information retrieval. And then we want to read those documents to work out the answer, which we'll take to be a subsequence of words in the document, which will be 833,000. And I just want to say a little about how we could build a document reader. So for the document reader, we have a passage and a question, and we want to find out the answer. Again, we can use the same ingredients in a quite simple way. So for the question, what we're going to do is take the question words as word embeddings. We're going to run them through a current neural network forwards. It turns out it's often useful to also run through a current neural network backwards, which then gives us a bio-STM model. We're going to take the final hidden states in both directions and concatenate them together, and we'll say that's our representation of the question. For the passage, we're going to start doing something similar. We're going to have word embeddings. We're going to run that through BioSTM hidden layers. But this time, we're going to do something slightly different so we can pick out the subsequence of words in the passage that will be the answer to our question. So we'll again use exactly the same kind of attention um, where we look for this generalized dot product to identify a start position in the span. And then we're going to also use the same calculation to um, generate an end position in the span. But in the generalized dot product, we've got a matrix in the middle. So we have two different matrices from start and end. And so they can specialize um, to pick out different information. Um, and Again, you might almost wonder, how could this possibly work? But again, if you set up an objective of wanting it to give high probability to the right answer, the whole network will self-organize so it does learn. And in particular, the LSTM sequence model over the passage will learn to convey information along its sequence model so that the sequence model contains markers of the start and the end, which can then be picked up when you're picking out the subsequence. So that kind of, so what we find is using deep learning in general um, gave much better results than previous question answering systems. Even this simple model, um, well, one? Yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> um, this simple model gave basically um, state of the art in 2017. Of course, people have kept on working on it, and things have gone much better again since that. But you know, you really can use this to ask simple questions. You can say, ask what question answering is, and find it's a computer science discipline. Um, you can ask about baseball people that you want to know about, and that works. Um, and you can get the answers to the life, the answer to life, the universe, and everything. It really works to a surprising degree. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to talk about. Do I do it? <laughs> OK. Um, so there's been one other very big development recently, which is contextual word representations. Um, so word meanings vary enormously in context. And our current word vectors seem not to deal with that. But actually, if you think about what we had for these language models, that inside the language models, we had these hidden st states. And you could think of these as like, well, maybe this is the meaning of the word in context. 
And so people have now exploited that idea to say, well, maybe we could just train very large neural language models and let them provide the meaning of words in context. And that will be a very useful representation that be could be used for all kinds of tasks. In particular, it has this great beauty because these very large neural language models are something that you can train without any labeling. We don't have to have a labeling factory. All we need to do is take large amounts of text, learn a big neural language model, and then sort of feed those representations into a network that we've built for some tasks, such as the named entity recognition I mentioned earlier. And so that's proved to be a super successful idea. So using that idea suddenly gave new life in which for all tasks, whether it was named entity recognition, question answering, co-reference decisions, sentiment analysis, it would lift up the performance of models to well above the preceding state of the art. And so that then, um, led into people trying to build bigger and bigger um, language mod contextual word representations from language models of this sort. And so this is the part um, where things get into industrial scale and how much you can do this depends on how big your computing budget is. Um, but it's not really, so big, bigness helps for something, but it's not that the ideas are complex, the ideas are really quite simple. Um, there's still one idea idea I haven't really got to cover, which is once things went on from Elmo, people moved on to a different architecture, which was a transformer architecture. That's an interesting different architecture, which I'm not going to have time um, to cover um, today. Um, the interesting thing about it is that rather than having a recurrent network, recurrent networks tend to be slow and that is problematic. So it replaces that um, with only using attention. So it's again reusing the same ideas. It makes use of a deep architecture ver vertically. So it uses the same idea of having skipping residual connections. But doing that then works brilliantly well. And so that's then led to a new model of language contextual word representations with BERT. Um, and again, that's then improving our results further. So word vectors helped, BioSTMs helped, these kind of representations um, help again to move things on further. So I'd better pretty much stop there. What I'd like to say is, you know, I, I agree that in the last few years there's been too much benchmark chasing in systems development in both vision and natural language processing. But on the other hand, it's amazing the speed of progress that this has brought, and it really has led to the development of a few novel but extremely powerful architectural ideas. Maybe they were de developed by craftsmen who were thinking about what are new architectures I could use to make things better rather than sort of from some deep foundational math or something. But these ideas have actually been incredibly general and incredibly powerful and incredibly effective. And I think that that's actually been a really dramatic development and we should also appreciate that even as we look for more conceptual understanding of what some of the strengths of these methods are. Thank you. So trying to stick to schedule, let's have one question. We'll, we'll have a whole panel discussion which can bring more questions about anything this morning. Please. Hi, that was a wonderful talk. I, um, I appreciate your comment at the end that you know, these particular benchmark tasks have driven a few very beautiful ideas that are giving lots of performance. Um, but these all are kind of prediction supervised tasks in the end. And I wonder if you have something to say about how we could extend what's given by these benchmarks to realms that are more unsupervised, particularly, you know, scientific realms where we don't have labels, where we, you know, want to make progress, but it is in a way that will require a lot of deep collaboration between domain experts and machine learning experts because the evaluation function is so unclear. Um, I think the notion of supervised versus 
um, unsupervised is very tricky because I think a huge amount of the opportunities to do things is to use effectively self-supervision where you use data that's available in the world to define your own prediction challenges which you then you learn using the tools of supervised learning. So these um, contextual language models that I was mentioning at the end, the Elmo and the bird, you know, enormously powerful. They're not only good for raising your benchmark task performances, but they're also proved to just learn a lot of the structure of language as they work. Now, you know, in one sense, they're sort of unsupervised. There's no one working labeling in a cubicle, right? You're just taking large piles of, of text. On another sense, the way that they are learned is by sort of just inventing your own supervision problem. You're sort of saying, okay, I've got words one to seven, let me try and predict what the eighth word is going to be. And you learn that using the tools of supervised learning. And I think everywhere you look in the world, and for all kinds of scientific data as well, you can use exactly that same trick of defining your own supervision by just looking at what happens in the world, by looking at connections between adjacent things, by looking across time, and that's a very profitable way forward.